All right. Uh, happy everything, Nubians. Yes. For some of you, it is very early. For some of you, it's midday. Some of you, it is evening. But wherever you are in the world, thank you for being here. Hi, Dr. Carr. In the streets. In the streets. Yeah. Love from the ATL. Yeah. People going to have a shock. No, no books behind you. <laughs> it's like, yeah. What's that? Yeah, they were shocked. They were shocked. I was leaving little... Uh, breadcrumbs as you say i was uh, a minute woodruff library the last couple of days for the asa Hilliard symposium which we'll talk about in a minute you know i don't care you see me look i know you know i bring books so anyway i got books for everybody yeah in fact somebody said that where was i oh one of the students at the Atlanta university center i was in and um oh no no that's what it was when i was doing rolling i figured i, I got on thursday night and the producer the young lady was like can you raise up the computer? And I said, hold on, yeah, I got some books. And she said, you have books? I said, yeah, I stay with books. I don't care about it. I got a, I got a, you kidding? I got a bag full of books. Come on now. So when but you anyway. Travel, do you, do you, your carry-on is books? Yeah. Oh, no question. Books and, right. I mean, you know, clothes is easy. Clothes are squishy. Which I know you love, so. You yeah, know, no question. At Atlanta University drawing, I got on my, oh, my oh. Oh, I had to rep this. There's a whole story with this. I had to go get this. Me and uh, me and my friends, because you know, age mates, we don't get to see each other. And then COVID hits, so uh, my people. So anyway, I tell you how that story. So everybody is, we just you know happy to be here. But I'm happy to see you. And and I saw so many Nubians in these Georgia streets, in the D.C. airport streets, in the Georgia streets. Um, and as I said, I would have been in Alabama this morning. That was my plan. But I couldn't uh, ratchet up the tech to, that I wanted. So, but soon we'll be there. Uh, Tuskegee has a game. Is that? I said I cannot wait. Yeah, Don't me neither. Yeah. Tuskegee has a game today. I was going to try to get down there. Uh, Clark is playing. Clark Atlanta is playing um, Albany State. And I feel like I was on a HBCU campus again. Now I work at HBCU, obviously, but like the one I went to because it's a Southern school. The young people were out front at the student center making handmade posters with the magic markers. Shout out to the Clark Atlanta students. And me and my friends, uh, Afia Zakia, Dr. Afia Zakia, who is, we, you know, is in these Nubian streets with us, who is also, you know, the newly appointed director of the Africa Town Descendants. So she getting mobile ready to train the school. She talked to Jason and we were talking about, oh, we coming down. And she said, no, y'all better come. That's what we've been talking about. We are going, we're there now. Uh, she went to Clark undergrad, so we went to the bookstore looking for paraphernalia. But you know, this is this historical continuity, movement and memory, and this whole question of the moment of memory. There was virtually there was nothing in the bookstore with the original Clark Panther because you know, Clark College and Atlanta University merged in 1989, so Clark Atlanta isn't that old as an entity, but um, they didn't have the original Panther. Yeah, that's what we wanted because you know the original panther the clark college panther is the panther that they traced to make the black panther party panther that's the panther that they make us because snick kids you know they were in Lowndes county alabama i mean this is so the black panther party huey newton bobby seal elders cleaver everybody right you know fred hampton mark clark you name it kathleen cleaver uh they all that's that panther is the clark panther so we looking in the bookstore and they had this high-tech swag out Computer generated roaring sideway view panther. I saw that look like that new slick Howard Bison they created. And then when I saw the Nike swoosh, I said, okay, the evil empire is here. I said, but then I saw this is the only thing they had. And I don't wear a lot of red. In fact, I don't really wear red. I mean, it ain't no thing. But and I asked the young lady, I said, Do you have the Clark Atlanta shirt with the seal, which is an open book? And it is the universal HBCU uh, motto. It's not Veritas Utilitas or looks at Factorum. It's not Howard or, or, or Morehouse or him. I want the one that is the motto of all Black people. I'll find a way or make one. That is, that's the Clark Atlanta method motto, right? And so she said, no, I don't know. I don't think so, sir. And they Southern. So, sir, I don't think. That, so I'm looking in the back, me and Afia looking. I said, Afia, look. And up in the back wall in the right-hand corner with the last few shirts, of the original Atlanta University. Atlanta University was the first graduate school, the first HBCU graduate school. This is where Du Bois worked. And it was founded in 1865 with the smoke from the Civil War. See, all those schools in here in the Atlanta University Center 
they come off that hill. It's the highest point in Atlanta. And that's where they bombed the Confederate Army. In fact, uh, Dean Carter, Lawrence Carter, the dean of the chapel at Morehouse yesterday, told us the story. Uh, we were talking, and he was at the Asa Harriet Symposium, which I'll talk about in a minute. He said, you know, when Grant gave Sherman the order, and they came into Atlanta, because, you know, he burned Atlanta to the ground, uh, they shelled that hill. The Confederate had, Confederates had a stronghold there. And he said, you know, when they were digging the foundation for some of the original buildings on that hill that is now the Atlanta University Center, Atlanta University occupying uh, that the, the, the building, Fountain Hall, where Du Bois, Dr. Du Bois talked, he said they were finding bones of soldiers, so many dead soldiers. I mean, that that land is, this land is consecrated in so many ways with the blood of sacrifice. And so it's just, you know, he said this is like some of the most sacred ground black people have in the country. But Atlanta University is the original, the first school. I, I just um, didn't learn our motto until today. So I thank you for that. But also this week, um, I had an opportunity to talk about, because um, this week in history, 1906 in Atlanta, Ooh. Brownsville, right? So, you know, as you're talking about consecrated ground, you're, you know, let's, let's, come on. Go let's talk it. about that. In fact, you know what I did? You know, I'll never, I like the newspaper. So this Let's is go. the Atlanta Journal Constitution <laughs> from uh, Thursday. Uh, man, this week has been crazy. I'll tell you all about that. But no, no, wait, before I say another word, please, uh, Professor Hunter, walk us through that conversation y'all had. No, I was you... going to say, I did a very rudimentary, <laughs> I'm like, I know you no. could do better. What did um, you say? You know, but you you talked about how Atlanta was burnt to the ground, but black people built it back up. And by 1906, there was a thriving black community in Brownsville, of, you know, like Rosewood, like Greenwood, thriving businesses, thriving institutions, churches, schools, thriving, thriving. And of course, uh, as Dr. Caritha Mitchell will always say, you know, black progress and joy will bring white terrorism. And there was a governor's race that year. And what did they use uh, as a linchpin, as a rallying cry, this notion of black votership? So there was voter suppression that year, a lot of voter suppression and a lot of talk of whites keeping, maintaining their rights with the burgeoning black community. And then because the Atlanta Journal Constitution and the other, what's the other Atlanta paper? There was another Atlanta paper owned by two people who were running. They started posting, uh, false stories of black men raping and black men being violent towards white people, which then allowed for white folk to go, oh, let's go kill black people. Let's go. So they leveled Brownsville in 1906. Uh, was it September 22nd? I think was the day. The 22nd was the first day of a four day white normal behavior. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> well, no, I mean, no, no, it is. no, because we need to start calling that because that is exactly what I mean. And, you know, so many ancestors. I, in fact, I, we talked about this on that day. In fact, my talk at the Hilliard Symposium was on Thursday. And so it was the first day. It marks the anniversary of the first day in 1906. And I, you know, as I was saying to everybody, I said, y'all know me. You know, I'm reading new paper. So I, I got the paper as soon as I came out the sky at Atlanta. Hartsfield, Atlanta, Maynard Jackson Airport. Uh, shout out. We just continue to think about Flint, Michigan. Continue to think about Jackson, Mississippi. Continue to think about our fam in Puerto Rico and all the places in the Caribbean where it's hurricane season and they're sweeping through there now. And they've lost power on the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, but in Jackson, of course, the fight that these white supremacists and, and their friends and supporters, including the thief, uh, Brett Favre, shout out to Brett Favre, who made sure they put a volleyball stadium in it. I mean, uh, what, is, what is his daughter play? Was it volleyball? Some in Southern Mississippi. They took the money out the mouths of starving children and gave it to Southern Mississippi. Anyway, you know, he went to airport as uh, Mayor Lumumba and the folks in Jackson have been saying, these white boys went to airport. Well, Atlanta Hartsfield, of course, is a model for how you use an airport for an, an engine of economic progress and uh, Mayor Jackson. So when I flew in, you know, I got out the plane and I went right to the shop and bought the Atlanta Journal Constitution, uh, looking for the black newspapers, Atlanta Daily World and stuff. I had to get into the city for that. But um, the front cover of the uh, Atlanta Journal Constitution, continuing propaganda, 
black people being attacked of sorts. Black voters, a problem for Abrams, of course. And then, of course, black men, then as now, going to be blamed somehow black men vote for Kemp. It's a lie. But this is propaganda. Now, I know Ernie Suggs, good brother, writing about, you know, but the AJC, they are already doing. Talk about parallels. <laughs> you know, what I'm this, this is what, you know, and if we don't see this, right? They use the media it. arm. They they use their media arms. It was the Atlanta Journal Constitution that posted those stories that black men were being violent and raping in 1906. Yes. It's the Atlanta Journal Constitution today it was a governor's race. Is a governor's race now? Is voter suppression then? Is voter suppression now? So all of this talk, like oh, we I'm not voting. It's they want you not to vote, which is why this is. And so they're gonna if you, if you vote too much, they're gonna trump up stories, and then if it gets too close. They're going to try to come in and decimate. This time, we should be ready, though. I'm just we saying. should be ready. In fact, please help walk us through this. Because and now you all know, the Nubians know, and everybody else watching, you've heard Professor Hunter say this uh, countless times. We do not plan this. <laughs> we, not, we do not plan this. But <laughs> as a as a journalist, a working journalist, and a professor of journalism for many years, help me understand how this gets to be a headline in a newspaper as if they report news instead of shaping news how do you get it how does this happen this is foundational right so you know i was i teach journalism i had um domati pongo in my class yesterday uh he's at mtv and my students man this semester i'm so happy uh but i, I prepped him i'm like your grade is dependent on you coming up with some good questions for him he even texted me he was like i've never been asked questions like that before and i'm you know i'm in journalism but if you think about the foundational roots of journalism what's the purpose you know they call it the third you know third state this is the protection against tyranny but it's been used as a battering ram whether we're talking about actual newspapers or like birth of a nation films or hmm. it's been used as a battering ram to push forth agendas that will keep people in their place right and that we talked about it even during world war ii they bombed japanese the japanese and the white newspaper the the paper on record the new york times said no there's no problem here it took a black <laughs> journalist right and a black paper hmm to say, no, I have a medical background. This is going to hurt generations. This is horrible. Right. So so we need black media, but we need black media not to be white, uh, black face versions of white media. We need black media that's not going to be around the clock perpetuating the same thing for clicks and algorithms. We need black media, media to dig into the soil of what's happening in our community to empower us. And I don't think, you know, we haven't had it recently. It's been decimated, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even talking about black journalists, not yes. media personalities who are recycling headlines they read in propaganda sheets. And then because they got a show and can put two words together, they all of a sudden become, you're not, you're not reporters. I, mean, I know you, you're training reporters, Professor. They, they ain't doing repeating what they saw in the headlines. I'm like, and of this course, of course, like Don Lemon letting that white lady get on TV and talk oh, about wow. black king, kings uh, should be should be paying reparations. I was like, and you are so not prepared to have any kind of deep conversation, you news reader, you, you entertainer, you know. Um, but, you know, it's a frustration with all the other things that I'm doing that this is probably the most important thing to train the next generation. It's going to take maybe 10 years for us to see the results of that training, but there's really nobody else doing that work mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And there's so many institutes for media and social justice. And, you know, there's a lot of money being thrown at people. Ooh. But this is the work. This is the work to, to train. And, 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 and it's not even about being in a classroom. It's about awakening people's curiosity about the things that are going on around them and empowering them to talk about it in a medium that can dis be disseminated to all of us. Because there are things going on right now that we know nothing about because all we're going to hear about is uh, Uduka's relationship and uh, some other nonsense. Right. Which that's might not be news. Yeah, it's not news. That's not news to me. We did not. We did not rehearse this. We did not plan this. We didn't rehearse it. And, and we are in lockstep. And it's almost as if you were sitting here these last couple of days, Thursday and Friday, to this Ace of Here Symposium. Because we talked about, in fact, um, my dear friend and sister, Iva Carruthers, out of Chicago, and by the way, happy uh, belated birthday, Jeremiah Wright. She's very close with him. They work on the Sam Proctor uh, conference together, and among other things. And she's in, in Trinity uh, United Church of Christ, a long time uh, working with him, along with Asa Hayard and Jacob Carruthers, and so many others uh, around the question of curriculum and instruction. So many people in Trinity, um, and and I'll talk about that in a minute. But just in passing, one of the things uh, 
Mama Iva did yesterday at the conference is talk about the fact that we are not as a community of African people here in the United States. And I want to be very specific about the United States because I don't think that this is the case in the same way, even in other parts of the black world in the hemisphere. Um, are not aware of the seriousness of the threat, the seriousness of what we face. And so when you talk about the function of mass entertainment media posing as news media to shape opinion, it's a very serious thing. Another sister who, um, another very good friend, brilliant educator who uh, now and for some time now has been at the Georgia State University, uh, Joyce King, Dr. Joyce King, who is the Benjamin Mays Endowed Chair of Urban Teaching, Learning, and Leadership at, at Georgia State. Um, she followed uh, Mama Iva and what Mom Joyce was talking about was the fact that Black educators are under assault. And we're going to talk a lot about this. In fact, she, she quoted, and I laughed because after she read the quote, I laughed because I knew the brother whose quote she was reading, uh, a brother named Chris Stewart out of Minnesota. Um, I do a podcast. Well, I'm a monthly contributor to uh, Shana Terrell, who you've heard me talk about. This is Shana Terrell, who hosts the Building That Black Educator Pipeline uh, podcast on his platform. Um, he has a, 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 a platform, Bright Beam, and he works with Sharif El Mecki in the Center for Black Educator Development in Philly. And so all my people, these are the Freedom School for those folks who have inherited responsibility to continue with Freedom School. So, you know, I'm in residence there with them. And it was Chris who wrote something in the Huffington Post this summer. And this, again, y'all, we, we didn't, you know, you know, we we kind of connect and then we move forward every Saturday right, as our metronome as we go to 133 in a row. And, uh, and I'll talk about all the Nubians who have been here in the Atlanta area who I've seen in the last several days. I'm going to see more today and tomorrow. Um, but she quoted Dr. King, Joyce King, Mama Joyce, quoted Chris Stewart in an article he wrote for the Huff Post. Let me read you the quote. Chris writes, in the American public education system, black children are the new cotton. They are a head count that generates revenue for a national army of experts who fight fiercely to keep our kids per pupil revenue locked up in whatever cartel they control. Black youth are the most studied and the least taught. Mm. They are the perfect captives because you can raise funds for their bodies without ever being accountable for their minds. Ooh. So when you talk about these institutes for you know, media and truth and gen, who's getting the money? Who's it for? And how do it free us? Who's getting the money? Not us. Who is it for? Not us. Who do it free? The people making the money. And Chris was writing about education, which is what led Mama Joyce to get into what we're going to talk about in a minute in terms of dealing with teachers and training teachers which we are here in this platform contributing to this great kind of reframing. We've been talking about this all along and everything I'm just sitting in and talking about and having a conversation with this weekend is confirming that and affirming that this new space we're in that is a renewed normal. It's the same thing you're describing in the training of the next generations of investigative journalists, journalists, because these people are not journalists. And as Chris says, the system is set up to fail. And you can make a lot of money off Black people without ever having to be accountable to or for Black people. Mm. But you're raising some very... Uh, in fact, that's what's going on. And it looks real good. <laughs> but as we sit and reimagine education, right, I, I feel like it's one through line, right? Because uh, yeah. even as we, we talk about journalism, right, that journalist that uncovered that radiation is a problem also had a medical background. And it yes, required it us, those of us who are in certain fields to talk about the things that we see, to not be silent about the things and they call them whistleblowers or whatever, but those are journalists. Just like that little young girl, Darnella Frazier, who held up that camera while George yes. was having his life. She's a journalist, she got a Pulitzer Prize, but she was a journalist before she got a Pulitzer Prize. Pulitzer Prize did not make her a journalist nope. and validate her her ability to hold up a camera and not leave a situation and let the whole world see something that was shocking, but not shocking. 
That's right. I mean, that's that's what's required. But it, I think our job is to motivate and inspire people to know that they can do it because they mystify it. They make it seem like I remember sitting in the newsroom and somebody's uh, some rich person's son came through one summer and they started giving him assignments. And I was like, uh, why? Like, he's he's not very bright. Yes. Oh, that's so-and-so's son. I was like, oh, so you could just be so-and-so's son and come in and be a journalist. Yeah. Like Anderson Cooper. I mean, it's interesting. Come you could be so-and-so's son and come in and now you, you have a byline and now you're legitimate. They did the same thing in sports. Some sports, uh, big-time sports guy in New York, his daughter uh, came through for the summer and I was working my ass off Dr. Carr and she was like, <laughs> I was like oh, that's how we doing this? Okay, so that's and nothing to do with what you can do. It's like, oh, that's so and so's daughter. Yeah. Oh. No oh wait, so and so a billionaire owns a newspaper. What does he have to do with journalism? Oh, all of these billionaires own newspapers, from Bezos to Zuckerberg to. Uh, so right. why are billionaires owning news outlets? Oh, what's that? What's that guy for, with Fox? He owns like a newspaper. Yeah. Oh, newspaper, television network, local, national. Huh, interesting. What what what's the interest here? Are they journalists? Do they care about getting mm -hmm. information? Mm -hmm. Are they suppressing information? Are they shifting information? Are they changing information? And we are captive as you just as our black little bodies in school. Captive, mm -hmm. captive you. Mm -hmm. We power black Twitter. We make that sexy every place we go. We 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 don't have no market share, no no shares, no stock holding. But we make these things. I mean, is it a Facebook without it? I mean, come on, y'all. What are we doing? Come on. We yeah, doing? Oh, no. It's, and, and meanwhile, the plans continue. Meanwhile, the plans. In fact, I was having some conversation um, with some of the folks in the medical community, the HBCU medical community, because you know, of course, that there are four HBCU medical schools. Charles Drew out in the West Coast, Morehouse School of Medicine right here in the Atlanta University Center. And we know that Atlanta University Center is the largest cluster of historically black colleges and universities in the United States. Um, Meharry Medical College, as we talked about before in my hometown of Nashville, and of course, Howard uh, University School of Medicine. And we know that last week it was announced that Chan Zuckerberg Foundation gave those four medical schools $44 million to split four ways to uh, get involved or to enhance their ongoing work around genetics and around tailoring healthcare to the specific genetic needs of black communities. And that's great. Who gets to keep the intellectual property? Hmm. Who's got your DNA now? Chan Zuckerberg is not selling. Chan Zuckerberg is buying. Chan Zuckerberg. Who is Chan Zuckerberg, Professor? I'm trying to remember. Chan Zuckerberg. Oh, it's Jeff. Uh, no, not Jeff Bezos. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg's wife, ex-wife. I don't know. But the point they is. Married. They still married. They still married. Okay. And $44 million. I mean, they made that back in the 15 minutes we've been talking. After they probably made $44 billion. But again, is it important to get those resources? Sure. Is it also important for them to get access to data? Yeah. Is it more important for the latter than the former? Probably, because they're going to link that up to whoever else they're buying into. And all of this question of how we leverage resources, if we are, and this, these are the social structures we live in, as we know, and in the governance formations, we, we have them. And that's something, again, it was just great to be in community with folks um, who remind us that we do have governance formations and we know how to fight and we know how to win. Let, let's let's put a bow on and, and tie that with the um see again we didn't we didn't plan this so and I just mentioned this because it was above the fold the propaganda on Stacey Abrams and uh this white nationalist Brian Kemp but below the fold on the front page is Ernie Suggs the brother the good brother Ernie Suggs who made the front page uh, writing for the Atlanta General Constitution says historians, advocates work to change 1906 massacre discussion. So the are the what the interview you did this week, and what you said, the discussion you had this week is on the front page of this past Thursday's Atlanta General Constitution, which marks the anniversary of the first day of this. I'm just going to read the first paragraph. Today, 116 years ago. A mob of white residents began a four-day offensive through Atlanta's Black Business District, as you say, and elite neighborhoods, destroying nearly everything in sight. By the time the violence and bloodshed ended, an estimated 25 Black people were killed. Immediately, 
Local and, and even international media outlets dubbed the event a riot. Over the last century, scholars have referred to it formally as the 1906 Atlanta race riot. Now we've all, well, many people have heard of this. Remember Dr. Du Bois was working in Fountain Hall at the Atlanta University, which is now the campus, that part where he is, it's now the campus of Morris Brown College. You've ever seen Drumline, as I mentioned before, when they crossed the, the fraternity out there, Nick Cannon and them, that's the front yard of Morris Brown College, formerly Atlanta University. That's Du Bois's office building in the background. And across the street, he and Nina, Young Burgard, they live in right there. In fact, down the hill, about maybe a quarter mile, is the football stadium where they filmed the, 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 the band performances. Uh, not well, the Georgia Dones where they filled the final, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I started to say this yesterday as we were talking about this. I mentioned and I said, you know, who's not here today physically, but always here as an ancestor, the great Atlanta based historian Larry Obadelli Williams. Uh, I said, Bob Obadelli was here, he would remind us that this ain't really progress. What I'm about to read next. So, Ernie Suggs writes. Today, on the heels of the 2020 deaths of Breonna Taylor, Richard Brooks, and George Floyd, and renewed interest in the history of racial violence, a growing number of local historians and civil rights advocates are trying to shift the narrative surrounding the events by renaming it what they want to rename it. It's called the Atlanta Race Riot. Now, they want to rename it the 1906 Atlanta Race Massacre. The Coalition to Remember the 1906 Atlanta Race Massacre will place three markers at key spots from the massacre this weekend. So that's going on now as we're here this weekend. It is to pay homage as well as to set the corrections in history around what happened, said Ann Hill Bond, co-chair of the local group. What I wouldn't give to sit across from Obadelli Ob Williams one more time to hear what he would think about that, because it was Bob Obadelli who always reminded us, proud that when them white boys decided they was going to kill all the black people and burn everything, and they came up on that hill that we're talking about, where sit the Atlanta University founded 19, I'm sorry, 1865. Morehouse College founded 1867. Clark College founded 1869. Spelman College founded 1881. The Morris Brown College, the only one in the Atlanta University Center named for a black person because it was the African Methodist Episcopals, also founded in 1881. When them white boys came up that hill, they had something for them. Because one thing Dean Carter reminded us yesterday, Dean Lawrence Carter, the, the long time, long serving uh, dean of the chapel, at the Martin Luther King Chapel at Morehouse College, a man who said, you know, as a Christian, I understood that history is important and I love being black. But when Asa Hilliard opened my eyes to the long roots of Christianity and the African roots of Western so-called religions, I asked him to take me to Egypt. And when we went to Egypt, I got to the Nile and I was so transformed. I asked Baba Asa to baptize me. Asa Hilliard baptized Lawrence Carter, the dean of the chapel, Martin Luther King Chapel, in the Nile River <laughs> decades ago. And when Dean Carter came back to Morehouse, when you come to a Morehouse event and you see the uh, the the, the the symbols of ritual in the Morehouse Chapel, the chair, the vestments, you will see the ox, you will see the Egyptian symbols, you'll see the Adinkra symbols, completely transformed the way Dean Carter looked at the world. But Dean Carter reminded us yesterday that the Atlanta University Center was not destroyed by the Atlanta race riot or race massacre. And what, what Obadelli always reminded us was if they had killed all the damn black people in Atlanta, why are we still here? And when them white boys said they was gonna come up the hill and end black education as we know it on that hill that contains now the Atlanta University Center, black folk was like, come on, baby, let's dance. The Atlanta University Center is still here. See, this is the problem we have. And this is where I said, when I read that article, I was like, is it progress to go from calling it a riot to a massacre? Were we all massacred? If we must die, let us nobly die. We did not all die. And some of them white boys met death for death. You please understand that on our word. Because what Obadelli would always remind us was the black women and men that defended those educational institutions in 1906, most of them didn't go to those schools. You know what they were defending? The future of the race. He said, you're not coming out here and killing black children. You're not going to kill black faculty. 
You're not going to destroy black education. Come on, let's dance. You let Sam Hose put his knuckles in the damn window of the butcher shop. And you read around here ready to kill the rest of the black people. Come on, let's dance. Let's dance, baby. And them crackers turned around and went back into the city. And so here we are. Massacre? I think not. I don't think that's really progress. But we, we should debate and talk about it. Maybe office hours. Because we have governance spaces where we talk about it. We don't really talk about that in mixed company. Why? Because this a sense of white superiority comes from us always thinking we lost. If we had lost, we'd be dead. And, you know, one thing Lefty Asante used to always say, and it tickled me, I agree with Paul, he would say, you know, we are the children of those who could not be killed. Because if they could have killed us, we'd be dead right now. But we're always framing this memory in this social structure concept of who we are to other people. So is there a better term? That's why I call it the Atlanta race, the Atlanta white normalcy. Tulsa, the, the, the Tulsa white normalcy. Like, why do you keep calling stuff massacres? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I just, I just want to say thank you. Um, I had a conversation this week with Ali Velshi. And, you know, he's a nice guy, really nice guy, really smart guy. Um, and he was like, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, 1619 Project, because we were talking about banned books. And, you know, I know why, once you let people know, and I said, the problem with framing Blackness through trauma and slavery is that you negate the thousands of years of rulership and excellence and providing the world with everything, right? So so I, let's start with Howard French, born in Blackness. Let's start there. Let's go beyond that even. And he was like, you know, I didn't think about that. The problem is, yes, yeah, 1619, Hannah is it's great, Nicole um, Jones is great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, but, you know, there's an industry, a cottage industry now created on this that they're not going to let go, right? Maybe they should. And I don't want anyone's pockets to be uh, lightened, but we have to tell the truth and not in an acrimonious way. And it can't be, you can't hold on to something just because you are steeped in commerce because of it. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? Like at some point you got to be like, you know what? Yes, this was a great effort, but there's so much more here that we must do. And yes, yeah. 1776, 1619, like you say, let's go, let's go all the way back because for us, we are in trauma porn, uh, we're constantly in trauma, 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 victim, victim, victim. But we are not, we are the progenitors of everything. That's right. We're abundant and we are all of the things. We're not, oh, low down, singing in cotton fields, uh, give oh. us free, give us us free. No, we are free. We are free. Yeah, let's just, yeah, thank you for that. And, and, when, and, when, and when Europe loses, it does not elevate its losses. If they elevate the losses, they then turn around and elevate the revenge fantasies. Remember, remember Pearl Harbor, remember the Alamo. And then they erase our remembers when those African men, women and children were slaughtered in West Tennessee at Fort Pillow. And those black soldiers, those men of African descent in the Union Army took those uh, guns during the Civil War. And having learned of the slaughter at Fort Pillow, decided we're going to murder everything moving. We're taking every Confederate life, every Confederate life. We do not take prisoners of war because they don't take black prisoners of war. They capture the white Union soldiers. They put them in the death camps. They put them in the prison camps. They slaughter the black people. And their phrase was, remember Fort Pillow, remember Fort Pillow. In fact, it got so ferocious for these brothers, snatching them damn Confederate lies that the Confederate generals wrote the Union generals like, hey, this is we got rules in war. You can't control your black soldiers. And <laughs> then, the, then the Union soldiers write back. The Union generals write back like, hey, war is war. And then the Confederate generals were like, look, man, we heard that your soldiers, your black soldiers took an oath on their knees. And when the white soldiers came over there, they, they, they sent the white soldiers away. And in that circle, they got on their knees and swore an oath to never allow, to, to if anybody bring a Confederate prisoner of war back to this circle, we gonna kick your ass. Why? Remember Fort Pillow. Now, see, I understand. I do, and I embrace it like a child. Why you white masses don't want us to teach this history? I know why, because I'm your open, enemy. And your real fear is that your child, having learned this, will put down that whiteness. And you know you got to hold on to that because it's the only thing you have. You worthless human. Because you're not a human being. Your whole humanity is based on suppressing the memory of that. And when you get punched in the mouth, you don't rest until you create a victory narrative for yourself. 
And that's very important to remember. So yeah, remember the Alamo. No, you don't want to remember the Alamo because you were the enemy in the Alamo. Santa Ana were the good guys. Mexico had abolished slavery. Y'all were trying to preserve it. You don't want to remember the Alamo. You really don't. Remember Pearl Harbor. Do you want to remember Pearl Harbor trying to itch you to get your way in the war? Do you want to really remember Pearl Harbor? Why those men died at the USS Arizona? While Dory Miller had to protect people because he ain't in the damn Navy because he loved America so much. It's a way out for him. But you don't want to remember Pearl Harbor. You want Ben Affleck and them to make up another damn movie. And y'all gonna keep making these World War II movies. You'll put a few more Negroes. You'll sprinkle a few Cooper Gooden Juniors in there. <laughs> and then you all, you know, look at us. There ain't no damn us. Do you want to remember these things? But see, to your point, Professor Hunter, my dear friend and brother, big brother, Sam Livingston, who's on the faculty at Morehouse, is part of a coalition, a collective of our people. Um, another dear friend and brother, Akinyele uh, Umoja, by the AK over at uh, Georgia State. And they presented at this return to, this is the program for the last couple of days. Asa G. Hill, you suppose, and there's Bob Asa out of Texas, Asa Hill the third. It was at the Atlanta University Center. I'll talk more about the whole program. This is the return to the source, recognizing the life and legacy of Asa Hilliard. The third. But Sam and AKM had something called the 1526 Project. We know 1526 is the year the Spanish brought Africans right near here on the, on the East Coast, South Carolina, Georgia, the area, the now around what we call the Sea Islands. And, you know, Sam is from that area. He's a Gullah. He's a, he's a kid of the Gullahs. He's Gullah Geechee. We were sitting there laughing about pork, pork rinds sitting there yesterday. Now, I'm going to say less because, you know, you know, some things, you know, those African things. I mean, it's so funny. But anyway, Sam uh, was talking on Thursday about the 1526 project because he said we have to bust out of this not only Anglo-centric history, but by going back. So, well, what's the difference between 1776, 1619, 1526? Because 1526 is just the Spanish. He said, no, 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 no. 1526 gets us out of 1619. But I'm also talking about 1526 on the other side of the zero. What? Yeah, 1526 BC. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, see, because when you go back then another thousand years, it takes you again, returning to the source, to the question of, and this is what he raised yesterday, African governance. Meaning when we start talking about conflicts and wars, how do we fight each other? This too is a question. Because this isn't a question as as um as Brother Howard French was, was saying, born in blackness, and all the scholarship that preceded him on this. It isn't a question of all Africans were saints and nobody else in the world. No, they're humans. And that is the point. They're humans. They fought each other too. You were talking about the woman king, and I have not yet gone because I've kind of resisted to urge people to say, Well, you going, you going to, and I'm just rereading some of the stuff like Stanley Alpert's book, as Amazon's a Black Sparta. I brought it with me. I'll glance at it again on the plane because I think maybe by next week I would have seen it and we can probably have a little bit of a conversation because people are looking, well, it's not historically accurate. First of all, it's a movie. Second of all, it's a movie. Third of all, it's a movie. 158,000 and number two later, it's a movie. The hell are you going to movies for for your history? You lost your damn mind. And it's Hollywood. It ain't even Hollywood. Why the hell would you expect? I don't care if everybody involved is black and they aren't. Why would you go to that for your history? But the point is, yeah, they fought each other. And what Sam reminded us on Thursday was he's he's now focusing in on the period in Kemet, the rule of Amenhotep III, who I also find very fascinating. Uh, Sam, David Wall Rice, and some of the Morehouse students uh, going with us to the Nile Valley. Last time we were there in 2019 before COVID. And then when we we're all going back in uh, August 2023, part of the work you know we're doing while we're down here is having, because Mario was here too, I'll talk more about it in a second, is having these conversations with folks in the AUC because we try to take everybody to the Nile Valley. A whole lot of Nubians were there on Thursday and yesterday at the Nile Valley Conference. Several of them presented, master teachers working on curriculum and theory and all this kind of stuff. And it's very important. But at any rate, Sam is like, when you look at that New Kingdom period, Amenhotep III, his wife, T, who we've talked about before, uh, Akhenaten, who comes after him, Tutankhamun, who comes after him, I, Hornhill, after him, Seti I, who 
who was fierce coming after him, preceded all of them by Amos and Amos Nefertari, the woman and man who kind of put the invaders out of the Nile Valley, followed after Seti I by Ramses II, coming forward to Jehudimoth III, Hatshepsut. When you start looking at these aren't just the names of rah, rah, we're happy, black people used to rule. No, Sam is like, how did they fight each other and why? He said, "What from my studies, what I've begun to understand is that in the Nile Valley, they only fought when attacked and when it was a last resort. What? What do you mean? That means that their militaries weren't standing militaries to go out and conquer people, but you see a change in the new kingdom. When you look at Jehudi Most III, who began to expand the borders of Kemet, and that becomes a problem. Because see, the more you expand, the more you invite problems because the people you're expanding into can become resentful because you're basically becoming a, a conquering territory. If you want to understand the homie, you don't look to no fake wonder woman. You don't look to the Greeks or the Romans. Who the hell are they? You go backward in time. So a 1526 project, I'm not against the 1619 project. I would embrace it completely and say, why don't you go on the other side of the zero and go 1619 BC? Now, now you're talking about something we can work with. But if you start in your history, dropping out of the sky, naked in chains, talking about give us us free, I'm not interested in that at all. Because that's a slave historiography. I don't care how many examples of heroic resistance you put. You framed your whole thing around race. That's why what Sam and them are talking about is so important. And again, these are conversations we're in. So, yeah, we have to bust out of those trauma-grounded self-imagery. That is a social structure narrative in our Africana studies framework. And in talking to Dr. King the last couple of, uh, of days, you yeah, haven't seen her since COVID, although we've corresponded. She, I mean, and I'll talk a little bit about all the presentations that, that took place the last couple of days. But I, I was very uh, I was very humbled to see she and a, a graduate student of hers just published a piece in the Journal of Black Studies um, that actually quotes the Africana Studies framework that we developed in Philadelphia and really kind of took great pains to go through the framework and talk about this this, this work she's been doing for a number of years. Uh, this is one of her more recent books, The Afrocentric Praxis of Teaching for Freedom, um, Connecting Culture to Learning. is isn't her latest book. She's got a book after this, actually, a couple. But, and she talked about one that Asa Hilliard framed called Black Education, which comes out of a huge conference they had in the Sea Islands, actually. Um, and so I'm raising all that to say that we were talking about this and she was she talks consistently and writes and works consistently and does teacher education around this question of how we reframe the experiences of African people to ground us in these cultural memories, what she calls remembering. So we talk about the renewed normal. It's very much in the center of this kind of conversation. And she spent her talk yesterday following Mama Ava Carruthers talking about the importance of teacher education. And when I tell you, hold on for a second. Let me pull, let me, let me pull the, uh, people do laugh. They say, why are you looking around? You're not at home. I say, y'all keep books now. Come on now. My sister, <laughs> Olisa Yah, who I hadn't seen in so many years. Lucy, uh, Elisa, uh, Olisa Yah, uh, Omiyale Totokun. This is her book, Africana Spiritual Coaching. I hadn't seen her in a very long time. Another Clark faculty member. Um, so I had to pick that up. So I came with books and I'm gonna leave with more books because that's just how we do it. We gotta do that. But um when let me see, yesterday, uh Dr. King, teaching pedagogy and teacher education, do we have the will to educate all children? She has spent her life and career beginning, if y'all remember, we talked about this a long time ago when she was out at Stanford and they put her on the California textbook commission and she was waging war on there by herself, and the Republicans had put this Native American sister on the same commission who they who looked white. And Dr. King told the story yesterday, said, you know, I was ready to quit because I, you know, I had my I had young children. I got to commute back and forth. They giving me hell. And she announced, you know, I may have to step away. She said the Native American sister came to her and said to her, you know, please don't quit. She said, because they think I'm white. So they talk around me and they said, if they can just keep King away from the history and culture standards, they'll be all right. And she said, what? She said, yeah, please don't quit. Please 
please don't quit because they are taught these white men on this damn textbook commission. And y'all know that Chris Stewart writes in that same HuffPost Post article I quoted from. He talks about how they control the textbook industry. They control. This is the war, the school boards, the fight over the thousands of school boards. This is this is organized fighting to keep us in these slave mentalities. And this is what Ivor Cruz was talking about. We don't understand the enormity of what we face. So Dr. King then went on to say, well, I was at Stanford. So I wrote all the faculty, help, help, help. She said one black faculty wrote back, the great Caribbean philosopher, Sylvia Winter. Now, Joyce King had been a student of St. Clair Drake. You know, I've talked about Dr. King before, and I, but I want, I want to really, really tease this out. She said, that is where you get the long response to these textbooks, textbooks, textbook wars that Sylvia Winter wrote. Some of y'all know the, the philosopher Sylvia Winter, Jamaican Cuban philosopher Sylvia Winter, still around. And it was her critique of the textbooks, do not call us Negroes. The whole question of the human, in fact, that has been a lifelong project of her work. When we say human, what do we mean? Human rights. We talk about human is defined by the West. You can by you can't by definition be fully be human. In fact, to be human, are you elevating the concept of humanity over everything else in existence? We've had that conversation. Well, Joyce King told the story yesterday of how that work as it relates to these textbooks came into the conversation. And I'm raising it for this reason. As I said, that uh she was uh preceded by a an embongi, a conversation led by educators, Quiana Cutts. Kosowa Lazin, Elaine Mosley, and Itahari Ture. Uh, Itahari Ture is one of the organizers of the conference, along with several other people. And I'm going to mention a lot of them in the next couple of minutes because I want them to be uh, acknowledged, uh, beginning with the family, uh, Asa Higgins family. So everyone, uh, Mama Patsy Joe, his wife, uh, Roby, and uh, Hakeem, uh, their children, uh, living children. There's uh, Priscilla, of course, Nefertari, Pat Nefertari and um, Asa IV, who are ancestors, along with their father, and my brother Ken Nunn, um, who is, I mean, you, West would say son-in-law, they would say son, Pat's uh, husband, and, uh, I mean, uh, Nefertari's husband, and all of them, but the Atlanta University Center people, I want to mention uh, Andrea Jackson Gavin, who kind of took point on that, along with Hari Ture, so they pulled this together, they're supposed to do it just before COVID, my man Clint Fluker, who's now over at Emory, um, was was leading the charge, but then the COVID hit. So this we're having something that should it was going to take place in 2020, uh, 2020 and then COVID hit early 2020. But anyway, I, I still have to say that Joyce King's talk was preceded by an embongi with several Nubians and and Prime Hunter uh, Kosua sends uh, her love because these are sisters who write curriculum, who do teacher education and teacher training, and who are participating constantly, probably here this morning. Because a couple of the sisters yesterday are saying we do we usually do our power walks in the morning, but we might be in here with y'all. Said no, nah, we've been working the last two days of what we do. We've added Nubia and narrative to the ongoing momentum of institution building, and that's what we're doing. So a lot of those people were here this weekend, and uh, I'm mentioning it to say that what they raised in the Mbangi was the same thing Joyce was talking about. Do we have the will to educate all children? And what Joyce King has spent her life doing and continues to do is trained teachers and teacher education. And that speaks to these institutional spaces, whether it be Georgia State or Clark Atlanta or Morehouse or wherever, the idea that you are preparing teachers, trying to train, train teachers to join a profession that has been completely disrespected by this social structure, including attacking our governance formations, which have attempted to displace our images and our concepts of what good teaching was and is, and I'll talk a little bit about that more before, uh, before we, as we continue, because on Wednesday, I had a conversation, I was in conversation with uh, our friend and colleague who just came out of the Atlanta University Center, Leslie Fenwick. And you know, y'all heard me mention her book, Jim Crow's Pink Slip, which just came out, uh, where 100,000 Black teachers and principals lost their jobs after Brown versus the Board of Education. And the pipeline that uh, Sharif and them are trying to rebuild, that we're all working to rebuild in terms of teachers, the pipeline of Joyce King and Ivor Carruthers and so many others, James Young, who spoke, who recruited Asa Hilliard here to, uh, and the Hilliard family to Atlanta in 1980, when because he was the dean of college education at San Francisco State, and they recruited them to come here. All of those teachers, all of those educators, 
Wade and Vera Nobles, who were here. Uh, of course, Wade Nobles, we know the great uh, psychologist who is at the center of African Center Psychology. Brothers with Asa Hayard, who kind of opened the conference, one of the co chairs with Mount Patsy Joe at the conference. They're all doing the same thing. In the universities, they're trying to train teachers. That's what Asa did for many years as the Fuller Calloway Professor of Education here at Georgia State. You're trying to educate teachers. But as you're educating teachers, you're trying to help those teachers develop content mastery, grounding their uh, area mastery, mathematics, English, whatever they're studying, the sciences, grounding that with an African-centered lens. So the work we're doing now with this conceptual categories uh, framework is just one more lens to contribute to the curriculum, range of curriculum lenses that Joyce King is writing about and talking about and teaching about and training about using that and also developing the content narrative. This is the stuff that's not freeze dried. This ain't the remember the time version of the Egyptians. This is like what Mario Beatty did yesterday in an incredible display of deep learning where he took apart Asa Hayes' last lecture, the one that we all saw him give in the swan a couple of days before he made transition in Kenya in the Nile Valley, where he looked at astronomy, where he looked at the stars and literally mapped out how the Egyptians replicated the patterns of the stars and their architecture, and more importantly, how that knowledge informed teaching and learning in classical Africa, medieval Africa, and in the most mind-blowing sense of all in terms of continuity, enslavement, people during enslavement carrying those traditions on those boats and continuing education. So after the Civil War in the United States, people said, why did Black people uh, start building schools immediately? Because they never lost the deep understanding of the value and nature of education. He said it was against the law in African societies, Asa would say. Not, you couldn't not go to school. Every child had to go to school, why? Because you can't be a member of the society if you're not educated. Now contrast that with what Chris Stewart is writing, where they experiment on black people. They don't want you to have no damn education. They damn sure don't want you to have a human education. They don't want their own children to have a human education. They want their children to have a white education to maintain the hierarchy. And they want you to get the same one so that you will bow down, bow down. So at any rate, thinking about all of this in the context of what we open with today, whether it be pre preserving memory by calling what happened to us massacres or riots, by thinking about the weaponized propaganda of quote unquote news media, which is just entertainment media, we have to remain not only vigilant, but focused on developing our own institutional capacity. So when Joyce King is doing teacher education at Georgia State, when Akinelia Moja is doing it over there, when you see, for example, uh, one of the sisters who uh, opened yesterday on Friday, I'm sorry, on Friday, day before yesterday, uh, Deshonda Patterson, who was over at Georgia State, the Associate Dean and the Alonzo, at the Alonzo Krim Center for Urban Educational Excellence, Alonzo Krim, big figure here in Atlanta in education, along with Benjamin May and so many others. And Erica Bass Simmons, who's a co-founder of the Africana Research Collective. She's the first recipient of the Asa Hilliard Memorial Scholarship at Georgia State because he left a real legacy there. They're doing work. And that work that they're doing is trying to bring people in to teach in a society, in a social structure that has turned its back on its own concepts of education. Never really had them, quite frankly, for most people. And when it comes to Black people, have tried to smash this idea that you ever want to be a teacher. So to rebuild that, when you're at the universities, they have teacher education programs, and the fight there is to change the lenses, to disrupt the lenses. One of the things that Mama Iver talked about yesterday is how what Asa Heard did in many ways was disrupt research. He was against this, these IQ tests and standardized testing that weaponizes tests against Black people. All this work that he did around teacher training, around what they would call pedagogy. I don't really use the word pedagogy from the Greek to lead a child by the hand. And they don't really use it either, except when they're engaged in intellectual warfare, which is social structures, because we got better language from our, from, our, from our thousands of languages. But that's what's going on in the institutions, the social structure institutions. We're fighting in there. But this work we're doing this work we're doing is governance work. So imagine this. Imagine that a child wants to be a teacher, like so many of us, because we had a teacher that inspired us, that helped us learn. And somewhere between the time of that five or six-year-old or seven-year-old child, and the time that child gets to be 17, 18, 19, 
they say, why would I be a teacher? I can't make no money or I don't know all the misconceptions. Well, if that young person, like in Nubia, when we see our young people come into Nubia, when we have office hours and, and children like Olivia come in from Chicago, she's there with her mom, her brother, the fam, pop, pops, everybody there. Hey, and she's sharing with us what she's learned, what she's created. Okay, this is beyond the control of the social structure to mess up. This is beyond the control of the foundations to invest in so they can assess and then help direct and shape, but ultimately control like those men in the California Textbook Commission talking about Joyce King behind her back and didn't realize that the indigenous sister was sitting in there and they mistook skin color for culture. And she gave the op research on and Joyce King stayed in that room. Well, th that isn't this. This, is, that, this isn't that. This is the place we have independent structures that we create. So uh, when you hear then the fights, and by the way, the panel that uh, Sam Livingston and, and Akin Yeli Mojo was on with that 1526 project they're working on, uh, also uh, Baba Wakesa uh, Mazimoyo, who was on that panel, that was the first in Bangi from Thursday, uh, Geopolitics in the African World, to be African or not to be, which is actually also the name of a small book that Baba Asa did with Mama Rema Ani, um, Baba Bernie Gallman out of South Carolina, another brilliant brother has done a lot of work. This is a series of essays they developed out of Atlanta called To Be African. Essays by Africans in the process of Sankofa, returning to our source of power. They dedicated it to our man, John Henry Clark, not mentor, Jegna, different term, a Jegna, someone who was fearless, somebody. In fact, if you want to read more about Jegna, I would encourage you all to get these books, which are all now back in print out of Makare and Black Classic Press. Makare is the uh, collective that was started out of the Hilliard family to publish Baba Ace's books and other books out of Gainesville, Florida. Um, African Power, you can read about that. That's Ace of Hilliard's book is back in print. Seba, this is where Mario took us yesterday. Seba, the reawakening of the African mind. If you're a Nubian narrative, and are part of that collective, those hundreds of folks who are learning meta nature and now growing even beyond those hundreds, then you know how to translate that. I'll say less. But the point is, and of course, Paul Coates uh, published out of Black Classic Press, he said he is the room within us, selected essays on African-American community socialization. All of these books, you can learn more about the Jagna piece, but I'm gonna quote from the uh, piece that Asa Hilliard wrote in To Be African, because his assertion and so many of our assertions is you either gonna be African or you ain't gonna be. This is what Baba Wade Nobles, Dr. Nobles was uh, working with uh, on Thursday when he was talking, you know, we either gonna be ourselves or we're not gonna exist because folk got other ideas about who we should be. Let me go very quickly to uh, Baba Asa, who of course here entitles this to be an African teacher. Um, his name, uh, in West Africa, where he was made a, a chief in the area of education and development is not a before a Makwati at the second. Let me see. Page 59. Watch this. Watch this. He says this. He says, we must consider our ancient traditions, traditions that made us respected teachers all over the globe. He said, all over the globe? Mm -hmm. Go back and study. I understand the Western Sudan. Footnote, and we were talking about um, born in blackness. And remember, uh, remember, Prof, when um, Brother Howard came into Nubia for a conversation and got a complicated read of his assessments on the Western Sudan and had to, and, and had to say when Tanya took him to the Nile Valley, he was like, I hadn't thought about that. See, that's the kind of conversation we need to have. Because Born in Blackness is a fantastic book. It's winning awards. It's been, and at the same time, in our governance formation, it has to be discussed. We have to have it in Bangi. In Bangi means a house without room. Rooms, meaning what? There's no privacy in here. What you think belongs to you. What you say belongs to us. So when you write something, you come in here, we're going to chop it up. We read what you wrote. How many times have you had conversations and you're talking and people realize, Oh, you read that. Oh, you heard what I said. Mm -hmm, I did. And I respect you enough to now have a conversation about it. And let's have a conversation. Well, we were talking about Mansa Musa on Thursday. 
inborn in blackness. And it was a fascinating conversation, one that I think that uh, Brother Howard might enjoy being engaged on because the question came up, how are you characterizing slavery, Mansa Musa and slavery? Mansa Musa and, he, you know, he writes about white women being in the harem that he brought back. And the conversation turned to, is that too passive an embrace of these Western concepts of slavery? Mm. The answer, of course, is yes. It absolutely is. You can't compare unfree labor arrangements or what appear on the surface to be unfree labor arrangements in West Africa with all these diverse ways of dealing with that with Europe. What Europe did is qualitatively different, paradigmatically different. It's a different paradigm. So to say that Mansa Musa, where he had slaves too, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. And that should be the point of departure. Now, well, no, explain that. And then explain it in a comparative framework that doesn't start with Europe as the model. And so what Howard French is doing in Born in Blackness, of course, is saying that this must be done, but then you got to do it, which means this is just the start. And so anyway, I, that, that was a footnote. Let me go back. So yeah. what Ace is saying here, he said, we must consider our ancient traditions. That's what we think made me think about it. We must consider our traditions that made us respected teachers all over the globe. Our people must hold their heads high in all matters that pertain to teaching and learning. What does he say? He says, African traditional teachers were and are, and by the way, Asa never called, he, he say African-American. And people saying African-American or Black, he used the phrase, but he consistently uses the label African to refer to us, even though, even though there were no Africans as a label before the invaders. We are just people from different places. The boat is what put that label Negro and then African and Black on us. But now having taken that label to project it backward, we understand that we're talking about creating something that didn't exist on a global scale before, but that can draw from the things that we were doing different places together, we can now draw those things together and create a renewed normal of sorts. He says, African traditional teachers were and are people of high character. Very important. A teacher is supposed to have high character. What do you mean? I just want you to teach me math. It ain't just math. The great Abdul Alim Shabazz, who at one time had personally had personally taught over half of the people who either went on or were getting at his hand a PhD in mathematics of African descent in the United States of America for many years on the faculty at Clark Atlanta University, on the faculty at Grambling State University, taught in HBCUs, was a member of the Nation of Islam at one time out of the mosque in uh, D.C. Last time I saw Baba uh, Abdullah Shabazz, Baba Lonnie Shabazz, was actually in the shadow of the campus of Tuskegee University at Booker T. Washington High School in Montgomery, Alabama. We were there for a, uh, a two-day session around education and youth that um, was sponsored by the Nation of Islam. This is shortly before he made transition a few years ago. Took a bus full of students from Howard University uh, led by the national youth or the youth representative at Howard then at the time student minister um, who is now a proud graduate of Columbia University. Um, we actually, Brother Jalil, uh, Muhammad, and we went down and I was actually on a panel with Baba Abdul Aleem and I said, Baba, you know, make a few remarks, but very few because you are the man. And I'm saying like everybody else and listen to you. <laughs> Very humble. A graduate of Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but at any rate, Asa writes about him in Young, Gifted, and Black, the book he did with Teresa Perry and Claude Steele. And he talks about the fact that Abdul Aleem Shabazz, Dr. Shabazz, was a master mathematician, mathematician and a master teacher. And the question he would ask students when they came to him and say, say with quote unquote math phobia, no, I don't know if I can do math. He would ask, do you want to do math? Do you want to learn mathematics? Yes. Let's go. What do we do? Come sit. Now, that's a story I didn't hear in that way from Asa Hilliard. I heard that story from Leslie Fenwick. Last time I heard that story from Leslie Fenwick, who was the former dean of the College of Education at Howard University. Before that, she was on the faculty at Clark Atlanta with Baba Abdullah Shabazz. Dr. Shabazz, 
she said when she got to Lang University, like when you go to any college campus where they have master teachers, they will tell you, oh, you got to go see Dr. So-and-so. You got to go see professors so and so. You got to go to their class. You got to sit in their class. It's faculty talking to other faculty as well as students and other people. So she comes and she goes to hear Dr. Abdul Alim Shabash. She just goes by his classroom. He's teaching math. She says she got pulled in by his method, by his style, by his character. Mm -hmm. His reputation preceded him. And after class was over, she said, Will you come speak to my class? He said, Yeah, sure. And then she said, And I was interested in astronomy. And I wanted to learn some more of the math behind being able to do that work in astronomy. So I said, Dr. Shabazz, I'd like to learn math, but I'm a little concerned because math was never my subject. She said, Lani Shabazz looked up. I believe Shabazz looked, him, looked her in the eye and said, do you want to learn mathematics? She said, yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he said, come on. And she said, well, what I need to get? No, no. Come to my office and we'll begin. Remind me what Holly Garima said. That, how, Professor Garima, when are you going to order the textbook? I'm the textbook. And so here you said the first thing we respect in teachers is high character. High character. Because he also writes in Young, Gifted, and Black using uh, Abdullah and Shabazz as one of the many examples. Carrie Secret, Secret out in Oakland. So many others he uses. Marcus Foster out in the Bay Area from years ago. A teacher must have content mastery. You got to know your subject. But you also must have students. You must elicit from students their faith in you that you can help them achieve content mastery. So they got to believe that you can help them. It does no good for you to sound smart in public. And people say, well, I can never do that. So people say to me, oh, man, that's a car. I can never. Mm -mm. You know what? You don't know me, but I'm your brother. I was raised here in this living hell, <laughs> to, quote, to quote the Doobie Brothers. In other words, we're the same. This is the beauty of Nubia and narrative. When we get together in office hours, when Dr. Betty's doing Metanature, when Dr. Amin is doing Maroon's Mess and Chess, when everybody's doing yoga together, when everybody's bringing their brick. The brick is us. We are the community. We are the chain. We are the fabric. So Asa goes on and says, who have deep respect, African te traditional teachers who have deep respect for ancestors and for community tradition. He said, African teachers accept the calling and the obligation to facilitate intergenerational cultural transmission. So you're not going to learn that in a, in, in a social structure public school or private school because they have their own traditions. They're trying to, they, if they teach you anything about black people, it's how you fit into their social structure. This is the first Negro, wrote it. Really? The first African to do mathematics? No, that would be the one that taught you numbers and letters. So what you saying? Oh, is you, oh this is the first Negro to get a PhD in the United States. That's different. Now, I want to contrast that for a second just in, in passing. I don't know if I have that book actually here, but you know, I'm going to look for it. If I look for it, I might even find it anyway. I don't know if I put it. I did pack it because I had, oh, here we go. Yeah, here we go. This, <laughs> this is Edward Boucher. Edward Boucher was the first person of African descent to get a doctorate in any field of knowledge in the United States. He, did, he graduated with a PhD in physics from Yale in 1876. There's something called the Edward Boucher Society. This is a Ron Mickens edited book, Edward Boucher, the first African-American doctorate. He ain't the first black person. To get, the letters that this book is written with came out of the Nile Valley. So, you know, reframing this is very important, returning to the source. But I'm raising it because on Thursday, after I flew in, came straight to campus, we did the whole day and I gave one of the talks. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Actually, I've already talked some about it. And then uh, at three, I had to give the Edward Boucher keynote for the Boucher uh, Consortium, which is the schools that are part of the Edward Boucher Society. Howard University was hosting that day. So the dean of the graduate school, Dana Williams, asked me to talk to the Boucher folk. Uh, these people include, you know, faculty administrators from Cornell, from the UCAL systems, all the way through like a, probably a couple of dozen schools. Um, of course, Yale and, Hart and Howard are the two that are kind of at the head of it. And a lot of HBCUs, but then a lot of HWCUs. I think University of Chicago, a lot of different schools. And so I told them, I said, I must confess to some dissonance because the reason I'm giving this talk over Zoom, and I left probably half the time for conversation. I don't believe in just giving straight, like we should have conversation. That's why office hours are so precious. We come in and have conversation. I said, um, I'm sitting on the campus of the Atlanta, the Atlanta University Center, the Woodruff Library. Uh, 
um, participating in the ASA Henry III Symposium, Return to the Source. And I'm sitting in a grounded, self-determining governance formation where I'm completely free. And I've been asked by the Henry Graduate School and the folks at the uh, Boucher Society to come into this space, which is quasi-free, and have a conversation about graduate education and the future of graduate education, graduate training, which of course includes teacher training, but the sciences, the humanities. And I said, I'm grateful to be able to participate in this conversation, but at the same time, I must confess to having a little bit of cognitive dissonance because I've worked very hard in my life not to be in these kind of conversations because life is short. And I had work to do. <laughs> so uh, as Tevin Campbell saying, can we talk for a minute? <laughs> and, uh, for a minute, I will come over here and talk to you for a minute, just for a minute. Because in fact, I gave a talk like that at Duke one time. Like we talk about black people in the arts and humanities, we can talk for a minute, but the rest of the day, I'm over here in the governance formation, but I'm not in the social structure formation. So we talked about, again, it's a footnote in the Boucher conversation, we talked about the nature of what's going on right now in higher ed, the nature of graduate education. So we talked about the, the disappearing non-whites and graduate programs, particularly PhD programs, what that means for the future. And what I said was, you know, the future of the universities is in doubt in some places, particularly among those of us who are of African descent and non-white folk, particularly poor folk as well, because the value of education has diminished. And as we've talked about many times, COVID has accelerated a trend. And so when Joyce King and Ivor Carruthers and Wade Nobles and so many others and Asa Hilliard for years are working in teacher education at the university, the real work that will not only enhance that work, but more importantly, develop the base we need is the work that's not at the university. And as I talked about Thursday in the talk that I gave on uh, Asa Hilliard, which was drawing Sebae lessons from his life, one of the things we see is that what we're doing now is really the work we need to be doing. We want to develop your teachers. You develop those teachers long before they get to go to a college or a graduate program. So finally, in terms of what Asa says about an African teacher and what it should be, he says, African teachers accept the calling and the obligation to facilitate intergenerational cultural transmission. African teachers also strive for the highest standards of achievement. In emergent science, in emerging science and technology, areas where the advances at the highest levels have always owed much to African scholarship. He says, our genius is part of the foundation of the revolution in knowledge and physics, mathematics, engineering, and cyber technology. By the way, the first person of African descent who got a PhD in the United States of America, Boucher, who did that in physics in 1876, he took that PhD in physics from Yale. He joined the Yale faculty and trained uh, generations, of, and then he taught at Harvard. And then, wait, what's no Boucher? Oh, I'm sorry. What am I saying? He was black, so you know what he did. <laughs> <laughs> he took that PhD, which ain't nobody had black, white, or polka dot handful of them in the world in physics in 1876. He got a PhD in physics. He then joined at the Institute for Colored Youth. That was in Philadelphia. The ICY, think about the great Octavius Cato, uh, the great Fanny Jackson Coppin, as in Coppin State. We talked about her a couple of, you know, probably 100 episodes ago. Well, that Institute for Colored Youth eventually moved outside the city of Philadelphia into the western part, a little bit west of Philly. And that, of course, is now Cheney, Cheney State, Cheney University. It was and remains one of the sources, in fact, for a long time, the source for the black school teachers in Philadelphia. You train teachers. Teachers is what you train at those HBCUs. The Atlanta University, the graduate school, the first graduate program, the first graduate school among HBCUs. What are you turning out? Social work. They were known for social work. Du Bois is on that faculty. Uh, taught well, I think, 23 years between two stints at Atlanta University. Uh, they train library science. The Woodruff Library is heir to the legacy of the master's library science that you got at Atlanta University. They trained social workers, they trained uh, educators, they trained librarians. In other words, you develop that cadre. 
So Boucher was part of that cadre of developing teachers because you took your training and you developed teachers because that's how you get teachers who have content mastery. And of course, during Boucher's time, those teachers are behind the curtain of apartheid. These are the teachers who were teaching at the black schools all the way up to Brown. And for a few years after Brown, until the integration move that Leslie Fenwick writes about in Jim Crow's Pink Slip, the move that they made in this country, this filthy apartheid South in particular, the 17 Southern states and border states, was that they summarily fired or demoted black principals. Because if you demote a principal, you've now gotten the person who hires the teachers. You're smashing the pipeline by smashing the administration. And I'm not talking about 10 or 20 or 100 or 20 or 300. I'm talking about thousands of principals. And then you got the teachers. You transfer them or you run them out of the profession. A hundred thousand. That's not a misspeak. A hundred thousand plus a hundred thousand black principals and teachers were run out of education, either fired, transferred, demoted, or just and they fought back. But a hundred thousand lost. A hundred thousand lost in between Brown versus Board of Education and the mid 1970s, with the most of the damage done in the late 60s. What they would do is they come in, demote a black principal. You over what was all an all black high school or elementary school or junior high school before, they close their school, and then they tell you we don't have a job for you no more, or they transfer you. You become the discipline dean. Your job is to check the school buses. Or, or go paddle people, or they make you, in some cases, a janitor. What? Or they keep the black school open, transfer a white principal to that school and make you the assistant principal. And watch this, the black teachers and principals in the South, most of them, bachelor's degrees, HBCUs, almost all of them really. And then, they went on for graduate training. They were more, they were better trained than the white teaching force. But if you got a master's degree and many of them PhDs, you didn't get it in the South because the law was you couldn't go to school at the black school in Florida, the black school in Tennessee, at the black school giving graduate degrees in Alabama or Mississippi. The state paid for you in many of those cases, Texas, to go north. That's why decades of black teachers in the segregated schools of the South had master's degrees and PhDs from Columbia University, University of Michigan, University of Iowa, Ohio State University, University uh, uh, of California. They had PhDs from the University of Illinois, like James Donaldson, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who hired me at Howard, who was 26 years old, got his PhD from the University of Illinois in mathematics, his bachelor's degree, Lincoln University, Pennsylvania, from Florida, James Donaldson. Could not go to school in his home state. Shout out to Andrew DeSantis. I love you. Embrace it because you're going to destroy it. And when you do it this time, I don't care where you go after this, but we you're out of our hair. It's a war, baby. And we understand. I listen to Ivor Carruthers. We got to understand the magnitude of what we're facing when a corn pone puffer fish tries to say that he's going to determine what you teach in your classroom. And as Ivor Carruthers said, uh, and Wade Nobles and I was saying yesterday and talking about, he said, hey, AC used to tell teachers, you close your door, you teach your class. It takes courage. It takes character. We have to fight back on these people. Then he says, therefore, for many African teachers, tapping the genius and touching the spirit of African children is not a mystery. Not only can our, not only can our children learn, they bring awesome intellect to the task. It is a routine manifestation of the African teacher's excellence to nurture this genius. Along with this, teaching content, character, and social bonds is our strength. So if you're going to be a teacher, understand we got models out there. Some of the models, I was talking yesterday, had a long conversation with this sister uh, who for many years was the chief educational officer at the Betty Shabazz campus. Uh, this is Haki and Safisha Mabuti and the crew that came out of the Institute of Positive Education in Chicago. And, and having that conversation uh, with her yesterday, Mama Lane Mosley, she was in a conversation, an embody session, that same one with Kiana and Akosawa, again, Nubians, around do we have the will to educate our children? We do. And we have the example, the best practices. Nubian narrative are just joining this long tradition. And it's so much more I, I would love to say. I mean, at the center of that, of course, is culture. 
uh, Marimba Ani, Mama, Mama Marimba Ani, who of course, one of our legendary figures, this is her small book, Let the Circle Be Unbroken, um, Implications of African Spirituality in the Diaspora. Of course, for many years, uh, your colleague, Professor Hunter uh, at Hunter College uh, in the Black and Puerto Rican Studies Department, Marimba, she's down here in Atlanta now, continuing to do the work. Um, just an amazing convening of folk talking about culture. And that night, of course, was the night we were joined by the young people in several of the African Senate formations here, including a school that you probably have heard me mention uh, uh, before, uh, Quilombo, which is, of course, Quilombo is one of the Portuguese uh, concepts of Marunich governance formation, independent school here in Atlanta. Uh, again, these are the practices. Y'all know when I was in Houston, hanging out at the Shape Center and dealing with the National Black United Front and all the fam out there, we have the example and we have the will. So just a couple more things, just kind of thinking it through in this in this governance space, you know, in this campus called the Atlanta University Center with all these schools, which still have white frameworks, but are populated by black people. So you see this constant tension being pushed and in, 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 in a place where, you know, has the highs and the lows of being black in the United States of America. The deep cultural groundings and the contradictions, whether it be hyper capitalism and hyper individualism, which are in many ways sicknesses we inherited from a social structure that don't give a damn about the people in it, much less the people who it is othered. All those tensions are present here. And so, you know, in that moment, sitting in that moment for these next, you know, last couple of days and then thinking about, you know, what the work we're doing the path we are embarked on, which is part of this larger work, part of this iteration, and part of the life and legacy of this elder, you know, Asa Hilliard, there he is in the Nile Valley. I mean, we had, you know, right there with Khufu Khafre and Menkare, the major pyramids um, there in, 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 in Giza. You know, it's caused me to sit and reflect on how we how we continue to jailbreak and that jailbreaking has these two dimensions we've been we've been practicing one is the institutional spaces in the in the in the social structure formations where people have been doing work and then connecting and not always showing people what they're doing but that is a work of kind of uh, kind of piecemeal work because you got to siphon off resources, you got to manage, and, and then there's the work of building our own institutions, which enables that kind of work other places. But that's not the objective. The objective is ultimately to create whole scale social transformation, which is really linked to returning to the source. And that's that makes all the difference. Um, let me see what else I want to say. Um, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, no, you, you got any comments? Because uh, there's a couple of things I want to say, but I want to. No, I just um, I wanted the article that you sent this morning that I dropped in the Nubia chat where there are okay. thousands, thousands of people. And I'm just putting it in perspective. There are people in there from California that got up at five o'clock in the morning to come <laughs> to be part of this. Um, it is humbling and also inspiring to know that so many people want to know. And then there's so much uh, consternation around those that don't want to know, you know, there's a couple of people in the chat, my niece and nephew, they spend all their time in, in their phone watching trash TV and they don't, they're mentally lazy. And, you know, well, how do I get more people involved with Nubia narrative? And, you know, my thought is always narrow is the road that leads to salvation. Few will travel it. And if that's the case, we can't lament those that aren't on the road. Just be happy. We're on the road and do all we can to not just stay on the road, but bring as many people along as possible. But we can't lament because wide is the way that leads to destruction. <laughs> people gotta be on that, right? So, you know, let's just make sure we're not on the road to destruction and not really be so upset because it's always gonna be the few that do the most. It's no always way. gonna be so. You know, no be happy you were among the few. I'm I'm happy I'm among the few. The few, me too. I mean, and, and I'm also happy about the fact that. It, it appears to be fewer than it is. See, the thing is we have to remember, and this is why I say, and unfortunately, and shout out to these young people here at Clark Atlanta University who filmed everything. Um, I know the committee 
um, was kind of, you know, finalizing whether or not they were going to be able to stream. And they didn't stream in real time. But as Andrea uh, Jackson Gavin and her crew got together, they were able to enlist the skills. And, you know, let me tell you all, we all know this, but I'm just saying it so that everybody who knows it, we can all be in that energy together. There's nothing like seeing young people execute once they have come into a space where they are loved, they are respected, and they are depended upon to be to demonstrate the skills they have acquired by master teachers. So this whole thing from beginning to end is filmed by young people. Clark Atlanta University has a crack audiovisual team and staff. I'm watching these young people, these young sisters with their headsets on with all the latest camera equipment, several angles, and they communicate. And then you walk around the corner in, in Woodruff Library in the archive, and they got a command center set up with the young brothers and sisters. They got the video up. They're looking at the screens, little TV production room. You would have loved it, bro. It just looks, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, so to see them. So anyway, in, in, in so the whole thing is recorded, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be posted. Um, the, the, the occasion of the Hilliard symposium uh, was to celebrate something that Asa Higgard did before he made transition and that now now his archive his papers books are part of the Atlanta University Woodruff uh, library collection and so I mean just just a transformative collection of books and papers and letters and and, and research outlines and syllabi think Nubians Thanks to us, you know, Urea set up the teacher's lounge. This is an electronic version. I'm coming to this whole question of who's and what do we do? Because our young people are, now these same young people who are filming this, communicating, making sure everything is sharp, getting the closest back, making all the microphones work, all that I mean. And I love the space of the Woodruff Library. I really do. Um, you know, I come in there and I'm just inspired. You see the young people in there, Club Woody, they got a little space with the cafe, so they loud over there in the library. But then you go to other places, dead silence, up in the stacks, down in the subfloor. I mean, just beautiful. John Henry Clark's books, you know, were here. I remember when Mama uh, Iva and Anderson Thompson, Ob Obedelli Williams, all the stuff was shipped from New York. And, you know, we came down here, you know, Mario Beatty, myself, Lethe Watkins. And I remember going in there in the summertime and the elders who were cataloging the books, I'd just be in there with the books. All those books now are moved into the archive upstairs. But anyway, in that conversation, part of the thing we have to remember is that as we stay focused, we are part of everything that exists. And so we say, you know, it's only a few of us. How do we get more people? When I tell you, you will be able to watch for yourself. So don't take my word for it. When they mount it, and you know, we'll tell everybody when they when they when they post this, you watch Mario Beatty get his talk he gave. Dr. Beatty, what was the title of his talk? Mario Beatty's talk yesterday was Comedic Studies, African Spiritualities and African Healing, Seba, the Reawakening of the African Mind. Taking as his text, this book by Asa Grant Higg the Third, Baba uh, Bafur, um, Seba. He of course took the determinative to do a little meditation this morning. Mm -hmm. so, just a little minute for those of you who haven't yet taken advantage of the fact that Mario Beatty is teaching the best Egyptian language class ever was in Nubia week after week after week. We got a thing Monday. Oh, by the way, tomorrow uh, Monday is Dr. Beatty's birthday. That's what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no question. So I said, MV, what you gonna do, man? He said, What you mean I'm gonna do? I'm gonna be prepping. I got class Tuesday morning in Nubia. Anyway, the point is. <laughs> So, uh, S, S, B, y'all know the determinative, I mean the uh, unilaterals, the folded cloth, S, the foot, B, C, B, but you know what you don't see on this is the, you see the Egyptian vulture, right? By the way, those of you who may be watching this on YouTube or other platforms as it's going or listening to the podcast, because at this point, uh, Professor Hunter, you made sure we are worldwide all the time, everywhere. And some of y'all a little skeptical in the comments, hoteps, this is not hotep. I mean, sorry, this actually is hotel. Hotel means peace. <laughs> and, and so those of you come to this hotel, so y'all should probably go over there with your master who you love so much and continue your slave education. Anyway, s ah. now this is the determinative. Here, the star doesn't have a sound value, but the star, of course, illumination is very deep conceptual kind of piece. This rolled, this folded, uh, this rolled scroll this is papyrus. So in this sense, Seba can mean several things. Seba can mean star. Seba can also mean learning, teaching and learning. A Sebaite 
is a teaching. But the seba, the terminative, when you see the star and the, and the roll papyrus, you're then seeing learning, deep learning. But what Mario did was take, and I got to find this picture somewhere. There's a picture somewhere. I've seen it, but I don't know. I don't have a copy of him, me, Theofalo Binga, Tony Browder, Asa Hilliard, Wade Nobles, me and Swan, just before Asa gives his the last talk of his life. Mm. And he gave a talk on Seba where he talks about this astronomy. A couple of days later, he was too ill. He had traveled back. Uh, he left Eswan, went to Cairo. He had gone back and forth between Jeremiah Wright's group and our group. And uh, Mama Iva was there. She was one of the last people to see him beyond Mama Patsy joined the family. And the next time we saw Ace's body, of course, we were here in Atlanta for a funeral. Um, just, it's very powerful yesterday to hear his wife talk about that on Patsy Joe, to hear Wade Nobles, who we were all together. Um, we got the word, all of that. And these are very close communities. I think about, you know, my student who was entrusted to us at Howard by Jeremiah Wright, his grandson, Jeremiah, J.W., we call him, who called. Um, we, I was on the roof at the Temple of Dendera, and uh, where, where you see the zo so-called Dendera Zodiac that the white boys cut out the ceiling and it's now at the Louvre. Um, but we were at the temple where they stole it from. Yes, they stole it. We start talking about culture, you damn thing, you damn diff, <laughs> you diff all of your damn in the Louvre and the British Museum. We come for all our stuff, and uh, you better not have buried Elizabeth with any of them jewels we got, because one day it may take a thousand years. We're gonna get them jewels back. Don't worry about it. You dig us up all the damn time. That's why you got our bodies lined up in your museums and saying this is Pharaoh so and so, and even the Egyptian museum. But anyway, story for another day. Jeremiah's the one called, told us that you know that that uh, Baba Asa had made transition in Cairo. But what Mario did, whew, he took that lecture that Asa did and he put the glyphs to it and the language, the same language we're learning in Nubia. Those of you who are taking this thing really deep, you will see the difference between talking about something and doing a few little pieces, you know, putting some kente on, making a movie with a few African words, you know, languages, you kind know, of words from different languages, and actually then saying, let me sit, let me penetrate this. Let me have a conversation with our ancestors without interpreters. And when Mario Beatty went through yesterday, this conversation that you'll be able to see, again, they're going to post it. I guess they'll put together how the formats and get this thing together. They're going to post it. When he talked about how the uh, Egyptian societies aspired to recognize oneness with reality, it will, it will alter the way we think about, there are only a few of us doing this work. So I'll keep this very short. When we die, we just change. You're entering another form of reality. He said for, for, for pharaonic society, and then he went into the whole meaning of the perwa, you know, of the plant. This is very perwa, great house, the great house. Very, I mean, it's very important work, but anyway, what he says is there are many words for ancestors. One of, an, one of the words for ancestors is imiute. Imiute literally means those who are in front. Now, when we uh, undertake this Africana studies course and we get to the weeks where we talk about science and technology in our conceptual categories, the science and technology category, one of the readings we're going to have, and I just confirmed with the Comedic Institute of Chicago, so we'll be able to get copies of Science and Oppression, Jacob Carruthers' essay, where he talks about in 1972, this whole notion of how the West creates this ordinal classification, this hierarchy and ranking of human societies, this ranking of knowledge, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So anytime you think of, who's your top five? Jacob Carruthers is like, here we go again. That Western ordinal classification, not to be, not that we're not trying to measure excellence and criteria, but what they're doing with the West is othering. I need, I need a label for you. I need a name for you. I need a box for you so I can then begin to take this apart and put it back together in the ways that don't necessarily conform with nature, but they conform with my purpose, which is what control. I need a periodic table. What happened when you put this element with this element? <laughs> Boom! Oh, shit. <laughs> that was never supposed to go with that. No, no, no. I took it apart so I could control it and manage it. Now, they call that progress, but it ain't always progress. <laughs> it's the, Jim Carruthers got science and depression. Your mentality is control. 
because you have an idea that somehow you want to improve on the design that brought you on the planet to be able to think you could, could even improve on the design. But so you're not looking for looking to see the symmetry in things. You're looking to see it as separate parts that you can take apart and put together and put. And next thing you know, you blow up the damn world. And for the first time in human history, you all get the most recent issue of foreign affairs, the age of uncertainty, the centennial issue. They done finally figured out. Oh, we're, we're the first uh, first era where the species can destroy everything. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> anyway, Corella says, and if you get out of that trap, we begin to think differently. Because, see, even the things that look like be, that humanity is coming to its senses is the West trying to still lead. We're going to clean up the mess we made. Who is we? Well, just these people over here. All right, but we're going to tell the world. Okay, we're going. It's the environmentalist movement. We're going. Really? Why do we even need an environment? Oh, it's like the British saying they abolished slavery. Well, who started it? So you're giving yourself credit for start stopping something that you helped start. Get them. Stop listening to these people. Do you understand? To be African or not to be, meaning to be African, don't just mean to be African for Africans. It means to be African, as Asa always said, for the world. You know, Asa he used to say, he said, uh, and there was the principal of the Asa G. Hilliard Elementary School was there yesterday. This is a white woman, a white woman, a school in East Point, Georgia, the mayor of East Point, former East Point, uh, mayor of East Point, is Patsy Joel Hilliard, Asa Hilliard's wife. She was the mayor. They have a school name for him. They built the school in 2015, 2016, 2016, the new school. It's named for Asa. And Asa Hill used to say, I have never met children of any race who weren't geniuses. So we ain't talking about black being anti-white. See, Andrew DeSantis is a clown. They don't mean you don't have a brain. He's a, a hateful man. He is an enemy of our common humanity, but that don't mean he's not smart. Now, I understand why uh brother, what's his name? Raynard? I can't think of his name. He calls himself Charlemagne the Guy. Oh, Len Lenard. Lenard. Len I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want, I want to call the man out his name, which means I don't want to call the man out his name. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, my point is, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I understand why he would say that Andrew DeSantis is a genius. But Andrew DeSantis is a genius and you a genius. And Ace will hear you say, as babies, all y'all was geniuses. In fact, the black children may have a bit of an advantage. We talk about that as well. But something happens between the time a black child come out of her mother's womb and the time they get grown enough to get on uh, Comedy Central and call a straight out racist a genius. Child. Exactly. Something happened between child and adult to keep one of these people a permanent child. But anyway, we talk about that. <laughs> exactly, child. In other words, it's so funny, isn't it? How do you bind the ways of knowing? When we say child of each other, that means what? We're we're taking it back to a moment when we were absolutely cured before socialization. Did you see child? In other words, let's go back to when because children understand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Something happened between child and now. To make us say, I ain't gonna be no teacher, or I think Harvard is better than uh, than Morgan State, or listen, you gotta go to school. You ain't go to school. I didn't, mm -hmm, child. And then we go back to baby and start again or start forward. This is why teacher education that Joyce King is doing is extremely important. Teacher education that we are doing enhances that, and she's all in. They got a program that I, I want to ask. I want to ask her to talk more about that with us that they have in about a dozen different cities doing this cultural grounding work. We're all doing the same work. We just connecting and Afia is a key is helping in that. So, you know, she's part of our community here as well. Uh, but at any rate, when I'm going with this, Dr. Beatty says that, remember I was talking about science and oppression, which we will talk about. Carruthers says that if you get past that ordinal classification system, he writes about the, the essay isn't long. He says, there's a reserve theory of progress that the West has. The cultural assumption is that now is better than then. Y'all heard me talk about this before. We're going to read it together line by line and then work with it, work through it, connect to it. Here's the thing. Dr. Beatty said the ancestors are called many different names in, in Egyptian language. And he said, I won't try to reduce that to one over the other. He says, I like to think about the concept of ancestors in a broader formation because they have different names, these clusters of names. He said, but one of the names, the, one of the names that Emiyahut, those who are in front, 
That's what it translates as. Those who are in front. He says, think about that in terms of an Africana way of knowing, in terms of our conceptual categories. Think about that as distinct from the West. Your ancestors are those behind you in the West. You put Elizabeth II in the ground, she venerate her, and then you move on. It's going to improve. It's going to get better. You get farther away from them as you move forward. Backward and forward in time, linear, backward, forward, backward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward, forward. What if you, you know, your ancestors, you're going to join your ancestors one day. They're in front of you. So, you know, your father, my father, prof, they're in front of us. Mm. My mom's in front of me. You know what? You, you, you're going to join. They never leave. So they're not just in front of you. That Your mom gave birth to you, which means what? They behind you and in front of you and around you. There's a concept in comedic language, uh, mehet, which means past, present, and future at the same time. It's a, it's almost a tense. Wade Nobles was talking about the verb be on Thursday. He said, you know, we be. Yeah, yeah. Ice Cube said, we be clubbing. We, man, we club yesterday, we're going to club tonight and tomorrow. I know it's Sunday, but we be clubbing. <laughs> be, be, be explodes the linear. B, what is it? What do they call it in, in, in grammar? Transitive. I mean, I, I'm not even reduced to the Western concepts because B is a is an intransitive. Meaning what? It exists across the time signatures. But this is why it's important as it relates to how oh, man, how can we get more people? How can we go? All the people except us. All the people who except us, B. Where they be? Beyond our sight. But when we think about them, we smile. Mm -hmm. When we think about what they would think of us in moments we've done well, we smile. Your father proud of you. Yeah, he is proud of you. Why? He be. But he passed. No, he be. And you be. So you thinking we the minority, it's impossible to be the minority, ultimately. Let me read to you from just something in this uh, foreign affairs as the, as the world dawns. Word dawns on them. This is... Uh, Remember we mentioned this article of the book, William McCaskill, What We Owe the Future. He got the lead article in here called The Beginning of History. I, it cracks me up how Europe begins to understand what's going on and they start catching up. Watch this. Hmm. He says, uh, in fact, page 13, those who are yet to come. Now the Congo would say, once you're born, you put the youngest with the oldest. Why? Because the oldest is getting ready to go back to where the youngest just came from. And that's why babies and old folks got to understand it. Because the B beyond, they understand. One just came back from the place, the other one going. So when this cat says, those who are yet to come, I'm thinking it through the lens of science and oppression. You got a beginning, middle, and end. You got a linear concept. This is what he says. He says, the fossil record indicates that the average mammal species lasts a million years. By this measure, we have, meaning human beings, about 700,000 years ahead of us. During this time, even if humanity remained earthbound, think about the fact that we read Octavia Butler. It came up Thursday, by the way. The Nubians was like, we read Octavia Butler, we read Carter G. Wilson, we read Tony K. Bambara, we read Du Bois. I mean, and of course, I'm sitting when we remember when we read Souls, and he got that chapter on, on the wings of Atalanta, and we went through the chapter on the on the Freedmen's Bureau, literally sitting on the campus where Du Bois is drafted now. It's in a chill through your spine. Atlanta massacre that Du Bois, you know, Du Bois outlived everybody. So when he's writing about, you know, them crackers coming across the hill to give out some death, and he's over there with his wife and their son, and he got his rifle and out there on the porch. Hey, that building's still there. But we don't re you rename it a massacre. Nah. Well, anyway, it's all good. He says, during this time, even if humanity remained earthbound at just one tenth of the current world population, a staggering 10 trillion people will be born in the future. Moreover, our species is not the average mammal, and humans may well be able to outlast their relatives. If we survived until the expanding sun scorched the earth, humanity would persist for hundreds of millions of years. More time would separate us from our last descendants than from the earliest dinosaurs. And if one day we settled space, I tell you, Butler, like, are you finally catching up? And if one day we settled space, entirely conceivable on the scale of thousands of years, Earth-originating intelligent life could continue until the last stars burned out in tens of trillions of years. <laughs> what happens after the stars burn out, Professor Hunter? Uh, darkness? <laughs> we don't know. We don't what know. What happened the last time all the stars burned out? 
don't know. Were we here? <laughs> Who's here? See, now we're thinking like Howard Thurman. What, Howard Thurman wrote that book, The Luminous Darkness. In other words, this is a cycle in Africana ways of knowing. The stars burn out, the stars come back. The stars burn out, the stars come back. And one day, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50,000, 100,000 years from now, when the Europeans finally catch up, it, yeah, we messed it up. We're going to get another cycle. Like, well, y'all just now figuring this shit out. Hey, you out here counting, you trying to count stars. Y'all are stupid. Why didn't you listen to my nana? She tried to tell y'all on the porch of Mississippi what the hell this was. It took you to 2088 to figure out, oh, we looked in time and we looked so far out, I saw the back of my head. Yeah, it is a curve. Einstein tried to tell you he was listening. Einstein went to, anyway, that's not even. To, but the point I'm trying to make is he says, but you know what could happen? You know what he writes. He says, we got nuclear weapons now, so we might not make it. He said, nuclear weapons ain't the only thing we face. Several future technologies could be more destructive, easier to obtain for a wider range of actors, pose more dual threat concerns, or issue or require fewer missteps to trigger the extinction of our species, and hence be much harder to govern. He names artificial runaway artificial intelligence, mm. engineered pandemics, nanotechnology weapons, in addition to nuclear war. These are just some of the things he's got a phrase for. He calls it existential catastrophe. Mario Beatty yesterday says these classical Africans, when they started talking about eternity, he said, looking at the stars in that last lecture Asa gave, where he says they're looking at the stars in Orion's belt, they're looking at the stars in what we call the Big Dipper, they're looking at Sirius, he said, when we make transition, we want to join those stars. And we know, of course, they told us, you know, we're all stardust. And the Africans looking like, boy, these people are stupid as hell. Child. <laughs> it's okay. Y'all just now figuring out we're all made of all the same stuff. And you still look up a dark matter. What's the stuff between the stuff? The stuff is the stuff. Go look at the noon, the way the ancient Egyptians talk about. The thing that's limited is our perception. But if you sit still, if you sit still, as I was telling the freshmen in freshman seminar, oh, y'all yeah, drug us over here to talk to these kids. I ain't no problem because I'll talk to young people. I'll listen to young people because I listen to young people. And they were like, well, Dr. Carr, you know, where do we start? And I said, you start with yourself. I said, get real quiet. I said, y'all can come to Nubi and do yoga because when you get real quiet, I said, any of y'all ever get so quiet when you're thinking and then you just let yourself be and it scare you? Yeah. How do I get my child off the device? Challenge that child to do five minutes in complete silence. It's going to be hard as hell. And then challenge 10. Bring them to Nubia. Just in that moment, the thing that comes flooding in, that's what Wade Knowles might call to be. See, Europe want to separate the spiritual from the material. The Africans are like, what are y'all doing? That's that Cartesian logic. Science, as Jacob Rose would say, and depression. No, no, be quiet. So even, even the young people filming the thing, a couple of times, every few minutes, they're pulling out their phone, looking at the instrument. But what you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm paying attention. You sure are, but you're also paying dual attention. And contrary to what people think, there's no such thing as multitasking. It's just micro movement. So when I'm trying to really study, it got to be quiet because I want to hear what's being written. I want to see that. I don't need all that noise because the internal is the loudest thing of all. So Beatty then says, he says, the goal, the goal of the, uh, the pharaonic aspirants to eternity, he said their goal was to follow the stars and to join that region of the sky they could see, join the region of the sky where the stars never set. Meaning what? These are the stars that never sink below the horizon. Now, Mario knows this in part because his teacher, my teacher, Dr. Watkins' teacher, uh, Sam Livingston's teacher, our teacher, Theophilo Benga, gave Mario Beatty his dissertation topic, which was astronomical phenomena in the Egyptian coming, a book of coming forth by day. Most people read the so-called Book of the Dead as a religious text. Obenga made Beatty read it as an astro astronomical text because people think about the difference between religion and science. No, they wouldn't have thought about that way. So those are astronomical observations they're making in that text. And so what he says is when you follow the way the Egyptians created the calendar, we're still using 
He said, that's really astronomy. Then they give you names of months and names of Neturu so that you can reduce that knowledge to a concept that you can hold on to. Howard Thurman would call it a handle. And so here you would call it simplicity. Pedagogy is what the Europeans would call teaching. What we call teaching and learning relies on making the difficult thing simple with a point of entry you understand. Hence the genius of Lonnie Shabazz teaching mathematics in a way that a child could grasp it. Child, mm -hmm, get that mad. Do you want to learn math? This is the only question. Do you want to learn? Yes. Okay. Well, black performance and black performance on tests and white performance. Hey, all those exams that you gave all these people? Yeah. Could I see them? Yes. Yeah, what are you doing? I'm burning them. Do you want to learn math? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Now, if the teacher comes in and says, I can't handle this child. She wants to still. Okay. So you don't believe that child can learn. You, ma'am, need to quit. No, no, you don't need to quit. Keep doing what you're what are you doing. I'm taking my child. Chris Stewart wrote in the in Huff Post. You know the difficult thing. In fact, that article. Let me see if I have a a digital link here. Do you I have it pulled up? I got it. I got it. As a matter of fact, I had it up to share, which is ironic because again, we do not. We don't plan it. Plan this, but we yeah. Have to plan it in a minute. What do you see? What Du Bois said. Yeah, I'm going to read. You, you mind you mind reading that for us, Prophet? Yeah. We come in for a landing here. Where he warned us in 1935 that turning black children over to white America for their daily education risked making them doormats to be spit and trampled upon and lied to by ignorant social climbers whose sole claim to superiority is the ability to kick in words. I'll say it because it's written here quote unquote niggers when they are down. That's right. That's Andrew DeSantis, you punk. That's Greg Abbott, you punk. That's Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, you punk. My problem would be, why you turn your children over to this, these people and expect them to, why you arguing with these people over critical race theory? Do you have a Saturday school? Have you exposed your children to the teachings of Joyce King and Ira Carruthers and Asa Heard and Wade Nobles? Have you allowed your young people to sit with the master teachers, most of them black women who run these african Center programs. You see that sister right there? They gave her hell it, trying to integrate Central High School. Look at those fine citizens. Look at that white woman losing her whole mind as her brain is on display with her mouth wide open, whose whole life depends on being able to call that sister the N-word. <clears throat> but guess what? That young lady right there came out of one of the finest black high schools in the country. She didn't just drop out the sky with no education with a crisp white blouse on and a school book in her arm. That's Paul Dunbar of Little Rock right there. You understand? This, these are the great black high schools of the, with the great black principals and the great black horse man of, of, of Little Rock. And you know what them crackers did? They canceled school in Arkansas for a year. In Virginia, Prince Edward County, they canceled school for, a, for five years. There are generations of Virginians who did not learn how to read and write until they was up in their preteens. And some of them never learned because in Virginia, rather than integrate, they canceled the schools. Then they started all these private schools. That's where the white private schools came from in the South. And they took public dollars, your tax dollars, and funded private education. That young lady right there was trained in black excellence. That thing right there behind her with her fucking mouth open, she was trained in white excellence. And then you're going to turn your babies over to her descendants, the one behind, instead of that lady right there. And look at them. Look at the contrast. You said, look on that sister's face right there. That's what the girl about would call itutu, coolness. Behind her is a human being who forgot how to be human. You don't turn your children over to that. Chris, Chris Stewart said, Du Bois tried to tell y'all in 1935. Do you understand? You turn your children over. So what Mario was saying yesterday is when you make transition, you join the bee. And the pharaohs would say, we want to be in that part of the sky with the stars that never set. You know what they call those stars? They call them the imperishable stars. The brightest one, Sirius, the brightest one, the ones that Dogon saw. And here's where I end. Asa Hitty, the last talk he gave that we saw just before he made transition, he said, that's the star that forms part of the stars in what the Africans escaping enslavement called the drinking gourd. Mm. Well, Harriet Tubman said, follow the North Star, follow the drinking gourd. He said, do you understand that is African education? That goes back to the pharaohs. Y'all stop listening to these people. You take your babies. And guess what? When your babies change, they're going to change all of them. That woman going to close her mouth and follow her leader. That's her mother in front of her. She disrespected her mother in that picture right there. And she don't even know it. That is the ignorance.
of this system. Let me stop because I get fired. <laughs> yeah. in, in, in this article goes on, Julian Bond told us violence is black children going to school for 12 years and receiving six years worth of education. Yes. That's violence. And then later on, Lerone Bennett, the great Lerone Bennett, historian, journalist, extraordinaire, wrote about the post-slavery years saying, in 1865, when emancipation became a fact, about one in 20 Negroes could read and write. 35 years later, more than one out of every two, just in that short period of time, one out of every two could read and write. 122 years later, less than one in five black fourth graders are quote unquote proficient in, in reading. Uh, yeah, we have to take our children back from this. Prof, I'm looking in the chat and they saying you on serious for a reason. I know when you said it, I didn't want to say it. I you were the, say it. the drinking gourd, the North Star. Oh, and, the, and then one of the sisters sit here and watch when you see Mario's lecture, he taught somebody said she that star is also associated with ISIS. Absolutely. A set in that in that drinking gourd follows a SAR. That is the calendar as well. The story of Isis and Osiris is in the sky. This is what Asa did. And then Asa told that and then joined the ancestors. Understand? So we have everything we need, bro. This is, you're on serious for a reason. Yes. And you got to go. I'm looking at your clock. Yeah, right? yeah. Because those y'all, man, I just got a, a he's the president, I mean, y'all. He's the president. No, I'm not the president. No, no. I, I don't think I ever know. But I am on the board. I was just uh, okay. nominated and they voted me to be on the board of the uh, National Council <clears throat> for black studies i was on as a graduate student <clears throat> many years ago and i saw baba ak i can get you moja <clears throat> who is um on the board and i got the notice of the agenda which starts now i'm going to log off and log on i said ak <clears throat> y'all voted me on the board because you know i got two feet out of the academy now i mean i'm still over there but you know with my hands anyway uh because <clears throat> we got to do the work wherever we are he said yeah man your vote was, you know, your vote was unanimous. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I can't miss the meeting because that's how you end up the president. You're right. <laughs> and I ain't trying, but there is a new incoming president. So shout out to all them people and shout out to the really the organizers of the ACA. Yeah. Thank you all. So thank you. Love you, Dr. Love Carr. You. Love you, Nubians. Uh I will see you, <laughs> see you uh with Senyata, Dr. Senyata, and then of course office hours on Monday and yeah. safe travels to Ureas, who's going out uh to to do some things on behalf oh, of yeah yes so you may see me in office hours which means it's gonna be very different thank <laughs> y'all i'm definitely gonna get some water i gotta get some no no it ain't gonna be different it's gonna be the same we're gonna keep and we'll do the woman king we'll okay. get there okay love fact, you i should i should say this shout out to uh, uh to the flags uh baba flag and uh mama flag who came from la we've been riding a long time and we were laughing yesterday because he said uh, the woman king, what you think? I said, what you mean? I said, you see the woman king every time you wake up in the morning. Mama Flag, you know what I'm saying? Why y'all going to a movie for the woman king? You see the woman king every time you wake up. The mirror. Look at yeah, me. no question. You live... Anyway, love y'all. Love you. We're going to leave it with this, this yes. image. Yes.